welcome back the Secretary of the United States Department of Labor, Thomas E. Perez. Hey, good afternoon. You all having fun? Great morning. Thank you to our Vice President, Dr. Biden. I think there's someone else coming this afternoon. A few more people. And uh, it's an honor to be here. You know, today uh, for me is my father's birthday. Uh, and were he alive, he would be 92 years old. Uh, on Sunday of this week, the 29th, will be the 40th anniversary of his passing. I was 12 years old at the time, youngest of five. And uh, as time passes, I tend to remember a little bit less and less. But the thing I remember the most is uh, he was always at my baseball games. And so as I grew up and got these various jobs, including my current job, it was always remarkably important for me to make sure that I was at my kids' baseball games or other sporting events and to make sure that I was there to coach and be there for them. And in fact, uh, being at people's graduations was kind of important. A couple weeks ago, uh, my daughter graduated high school and uh, it was right in the middle of a cabinet meeting. And my boss said I could go. It was a close call. But you know what? Nobody ever sat on their deathbed lamenting that they didn't get to enough meetings in the office. That was always something that I thought about. And the fact that I was able to coach my kids for the last 10 years and still coach my kids and make that time is something that I have the ability to do. And as so many other speakers have shown today, it's something that all too many people don't have the ability to do. And this next session is going to be a session about the business case for why flexible leave policies are not only the right thing to do, they are the smart thing to do. Because there are so many employers in this room and across this country who already get this. They tell me time and time again that their most precious resource is their human capital. They tell me that if they're going to compete for human capital, they better make sure that they are providing all of the benefits that meet the concerns of working families. And flexible leave policies are one of those benefits. And so when I speak to people like the CEO of Costco, when I speak to people like uh, you know, the head of the, the, the president of the Ace Hardware store, a mile and a half from here. Large businesses, small businesses alike who get it. They understand that flexible leave policies are consistent with their bottom line and you should never make choices. It's a false choice, in fact, to choose between your bottom line and your worker. You can do both. You can take care of your workers and deliver a fair return on investment to your uh, shareholders and others. And as we debate this and have this conversation, and you're gonna hear shortly from a number of people from the business community, I would ask you to think about the following, which is to put this conversation in a global perspective and ask the question. You know, I, I always like to ask this question, you know, you know, where were you, mama? And where were you, daddy? You know, you look at the biggest movements of our lives. You know, where were you in the early 30s? Lloyd Blankfein said to me this morning, you know, it's a good frame. Where were you when Congress was debating laws on child labor, when Congress was debating the Fair Labor Standards Act? Where were you, mama? Where were you, daddy? When Congress in the early 60s was debating Medicare and other things that are now so rooted in the American fabric. You know, where were you, Mama and Dad, when Congress was debating the Affordable Care Act? I'm proud to say that we were on the right side of history on that one. Where were you when Congress passed the Family Medical Leave Act, a remarkable piece of family-friendly legislation? And as we have this conversation about FMLA 2.0, Let's ask that same question, because when we put ourselves in the context of the rest of the world, the current answer is, we're pretty lousy. We haven't done it. We have remarkable employers here today who have done it, 
But, you know, the fact of the matter is, Sweden spends more on child care and early education than nearly every other nation in the world. And it has one of the highest levels of GDP per capita in the world. And, you know, I need one hand and maybe not much more than my thumbs to count the, uh, the number of nations who do not have some form of paid leave. And that's why we're here today. And that is why it's important to make the business case for this, because other countries and businesses in other countries have concluded that you can do this. And we have seen it in states across this country. California, Connecticut have demonstrated those incubators of innovation that you can do the good thing, the right thing, and not undermine someone's bottom line. So that is why we're here today. And that is why our next panels will focus on the business case, because it is so important for us to hear and really to lift up the remarkable businesses, small, mid-size, and large alike, who have done the right thing. They have made that choice to invest in their workers, to give them those flexible leave policies so that they can indeed not have to make that horrible choice between the job they need and the family they love. To make sure that we understand the most important family value is indeed time with our family. Businesses across this country are doing the right thing, and public policy needs to catch up with them. So we look forward to hearing and watching this video, and then we look forward to hearing from business leaders, and we look forward to hearing from the President of the United States. Thank you for your leadership. Si se puede, adelante, and so much more that we can do and will do as we continue to build this movement. It's a movement for fairness, inclusion, and it is a movement that's totally consistent with our values and our economic self-interest. Thank you so much. The homemaker, the breadwinner, family dinners, what does this look like in 2014? <laughs> the world has changed, but today many of our nation's families are still working under yesterday's policies. Equal pay, flex time, paid leave, child care and elder care, the role of women in the workplace, how technology impacts business. The woman who works at a career has chosen to ignore the culture trait that considers the woman's place is in the home. Yes, women workers do present problems. It's tough, I know, but there are thousands of others, just like you all over the country, facing the same problem. Families look different these days. We have a different kind of workforce. We have a diverse workforce. It's not, you know, the 1950s anymore. In almost three out of five married families with children, both parents work, with women bringing home 44% of the family income. When married women with small children have to take jobs, everything possible will be done to provide day care for the children. That was from a 1943 recruitment video during World War II. But affordable childcare continues to be a challenge across America. Do I have to make that decision of being a good parent or being a career-oriented person. The family-friendly policies that we have are essential to our business. Policies which are focused on taking care of our associates. We have a flexible work environment. Child care on site. We have paternity leave. We have maternity leave. An ability to work from home or on the road or remotely. We have a whole host of other benefits that are really good for families. It's really more about you having some predictability in your schedule so that you can then decide how do you fit in the rest of your life. It's about empowering our people to make sure that they can get a really good balance between work and their personal lives. One of the things I've been able to take advantage of is our on-site at headquarters daycare. I cannot be as successful at work as I want to be if I don't feel comfortable that I'm adding the value into my family life that I need to and having that right balance. Today, women make up nearly half of the workforce, and more than two million fathers are the primary caregivers for their children. Men also feel these pressures. This isn't just a woman's issue. We see more and more men taking advantage of different opportunities to create new work-life fit. It's not 
you do all the child stuff and I'll just show up and bring home the bacon. We both bring home the bacon. So at the end of the day, we want to eat, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, so we're making that BLT together. <laughs> the government's policy is that women should get the same pay that men get for similar work. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. 61 years later, a woman still earns only 77 cents for every dollar earned by a man. And women of color earn even less. It's important to keep pushing and keep encouraging women. Well over a third of our top senior managers are women now, and that's growing exponentially. We have women at all levels of the company. They play really important roles. So I think there's a real correlation between a commitment to diversity and inclusion in a company and the financial success of a company. Who are the people who are most likely to succeed? What's the secret of their success? We need to offer policies that work for working families. Otherwise, we are going to fall behind. This isn't just the right thing to do. This isn't something you do just for business. This is what you do to exist. There are other workplaces that don't focus on family-friendly policies. In the end, that's going to wind up hurting a lot of those businesses because it won't attract a lot of talent. America's global competitiveness in the coming years will require workplaces that are fair, effective, and productive for both employees and employers, because good policy is good business. We wouldn't be in business without our people and these policies, these opportunities. There'd be no business, because people wouldn't want to be here. They wouldn't want to stay here. People are everything at the end of the day in our business, and really in any business. Investing in associates is undoubtedly good for our business. It is good for our bottom line because of reduced turnover. Great policies around work-life fit are great for any business. It absolutely makes a difference in attracting, retaining the best talent, and as important, having employees that love the organization they work for and will provide their absolute best ideas, best creativity, best self to that organization. We can't afford not to do this. We have to be able to compete. We have to be able to offer family-friendly policies. Good policy. Good policy. Good policy. Is good business. Is good business. It's just the only way to do business. Not about good or bad. To me, it's the only way. A policy through which you can build a foundation of security for yourself and your family. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Council of Economic Advisors, Betsy Stevenson. Wasn't that a great video? How exciting is it to be here on the 42nd anniversary of the passage of Title IX? With, with a godmother of Title IX, Dr. Sandler in the audience, we're here to talk about the next generation of policy. I don't need to tell you that families have changed. Women work more. They earn more. They lead more. In fact, median family income is $13,000 higher today, and our GDP is $2 trillion greater because of the advances women have made in work since 1970. And men nurture more. They change more diapers. They pack more lunches. They're more likely to be responsible for a kid or an elder parent's well-being. Today, one in five fathers are the primary caregiver of preschool-aged children when the mother is employed. And as you just saw in the video, six in 10 households with kids today have all parents working. There's perhaps no better moment that captures the changes in our lives than breakfast. The 1950s and 1960s breakfast table was a time of hot meals and calm togetherness. Mom's job was to get everyone out the door well nourished and ready to start the day. That's not what breakfast looks like at my house. And I bet it doesn't look like that at yours either. Today's breakfast is more likely to be a juggling act as everyone tries to get out the door without forgetting something. 
The scene is a chaotic scramble for lunches, homework, last minute double checks on who's picking up which kid from where, so you don't leave anybody anywhere. The problem is that our family lives have changed, but our workplaces and the structure of our jobs haven't kept up with the times. Here's the reality. Workers today struggle to balance work and family, and as a result, are choosing to work in different jobs, even different careers, and sometimes not to work at all, because making it all fit together is just too hard without the lack of support from work family policies. And the cost of losing women from work is growing every single day. Women today have more skills than ever before. They exceed men in education and are catching up with men on work experience. We cannot afford to lose them. Data from a recent Harris poll shows that we want our employers to do more. Nearly nine in 10 of us believe employers should offer flexibility. And more than half of workers feel they could do their job better if they were given flexibility. Even so, nearly half of parents say they've passed up a job because it was gonna be just too hard on their families. Too often, the things that make our mornings a little easier, like flexible hours, and ability to telework, paid leave, aren't available to us. The United States is one out of two of the 185 countries that doesn't offer guaranteed paid maternity leave. Only 11% of workers get paid family leave. There's a few more who are able to cobble together other forms of leave so that they're able to take paid family leave when they need it. But let's compare that to what Americans want. More than 80% of men and 90% of women believe women should get paid maternity leave. And a third of Americans believe men and women should take equal amounts of paid leave for the birth of a child. The reality is kids get sick. And with most parents working, what do you do when school calls and says that your kid has 102 degree fever? It shouldn't be that hard to make sure we can care for our children when they're sick and still be productive members of the workforce. While the demand for family-friendly workplaces has long been a women's issue and an important factor in the gender wage gap, dads are joining moms in prioritizing jobs that allow more flexibility, require less travel, or include paid paternity leave. We know that increasing paid leave and workplace flexibility benefits workers by improving their job satisfaction. And because they're important to workers, these policies help businesses attract and retain talent. In fact, company stock prices tend to rise when companies announce that they're adopting new work family friendly policies. And it's not just the businesses that benefit. We know policies like childcare and paid leave are essential to our future economic growth. As they're important drivers of female labor force participation and important drivers of the skills for the next generation. In fact, research shows that when women get paid maternity leave, their children earn higher wages later in life. It's an investment. So let's think back to breakfast. Most of us think of this as my personal life my own problem, my inability, uh, my inflexible schedule, my inability to telework, my inability to find convenient high quality daycare. But it's not your problem. This scene is playing out all over America. Our own struggle to juggle work and family has increasingly become our nation's juggling act. 
by adopting the workplace policies that are proven to help our businesses and our economy, we can make millions of families' weekday mornings a bit simpler. And in the process, we can make our economy more efficient and ensure that all of our talented men and women are able to participate in our economy to the fullest extent possible. By succeeding at work and at home, we will be ensure that people are able to both have peace at home and a stronger economy. So we're going to explore this business and economic case more, and I want to welcome to the stage our moderators, Claire Shipman and Caddy Kay, and our esteemed panelists to the stage to continue the conversation of the business case for family-friendly policies. Thank you very much, Betsy. That this, that this issue could not be more important, I think, for all of us personally and also for, for our economy as a whole. I had a little bit of a taste of the statistics this morning because my husband, who was working for the president until Friday and is now home, <laughs> is home dealing with camp and children today while I'm here, <laughs> and he seemed very happy to, to make that switch. But we're, we're also thrilled to, to be part of this illustrious panel because we are going to get a great point of view from a lot of different places today, and we'll start, we're not going to introduce you exactly in order, so maybe wave when I, when I give you names. Liz Schuler, she's currently the Secretary Treasurer. A lot of you know her for the AFL-CIO, and I want to, you'll have to applaud again because I was going to say she's the first woman to ever have this position. It's one of the top three leadership positions in the union, so. And she has worked on issues like this for, for years and is now especially focused on issues that affect younger workers and women. So thank you so much for being here. Nick Bloom, a professor of economics at Stanford University, welcome. You're also co-director of the Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Welcome, Nick. And on the personal side, which you'll soon discover, he is English and lives in Stanford with his Scottish wife, but so we'll have a number of British accents here today, some, some diversity of accent, which is nice. And Kim Jordan, thank you so much for being with us. She's the co-founder and CEO of New Belgium Brewing, which is... of the most successful small to, to medium, as we discussed earlier, corporations in the United States today, and in large part thanks to her, really, her passion for employing environmental standards, the issues about community, and some really innovative employee, employee, I guess, flexibility, employee positive techniques throughout the whole company that we're going to hear about, and we can't wait to, to hear more. Uh, there are no free samples, though. <laughs> One exactly. from Kim. She made that very clear earlier. Uh, Sheila Marcello is with us, too. She's the founder and the CEO of Care.com, which is a great organization that is fixing people up, working families up with something that, of course, is very important to all of us, which is people to care and help look after our children or even our elderly parents when we're not around in the house to do it. Um, Founded in 2006, it now has 10 million members in 16 different countries around the world. And it was founded really from her own personal experience as a young mother of two sons. She'll tell us a bit more about that in a minute. Bob Moritz is with us as well. He's the chairman and senior partner of Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, you were just re-elected last year, so yep. congratulations on that. He's been with the company since 1985. He spent a stint in Tokyo, so he can give us a, an international perspective as, on this issue as well. Having lived in Tokyo myself, I know how hard these issues can be there. Uh, on a personal side, Bob uh, has two children, but his real love as well is motorbikes and playing the drums, <laughs> which he's also promised he's not going to do for us this morning. Uh, Bob, I want to start with you. We heard Betsy there make out the business case for more flexibility. You've done a great job at PricewaterhouseCoopers on this. What have you found in your data while you were doing this? Well, two things come to mind. Um, people in general believe this is an important topic, either A, because they think it's the right thing to do, B, because they have a personal perspective on it, and C, the business case. So let's touch on the business case very briefly. If you're engaging your workforce, and that doesn't matter if it's next-gen millennials versus baby boomers, male, female, does not matter. If you're engaging them, you're going to get 75% more productivity. 
What does that mean? That doesn't mean more hours. That means better performance. And now, what the question is is all about is what's engagement? Right. Do I understand the strategy? Do I feel like I'm playing an important role? And oh, by the way, are you giving me the support I need to manage myself? And that's work and life. And it's not balance, it's flexibility across those two things. So it's really important for CEOs to believe the business case. I want to give you one other stat, which is really interesting. About four years ago, we changed our policies around paid sick leave. We went unlimited for paid sick leave four years ago. Didn't matter. And we changed two things. One, to make it unlimited. And second, to actually make sure the definition was well beyond the individual being sick. It was a combination of taking care of elderly kids, did not matter. And it was for everybody in the family. What's really interesting is the average amount of sick days went down. It went down. So interesting. So when you combined a change in policy with more flexibility, you actually got more productivity, which impacted the bottom line, which is important for companies, but it's equally as important for the country as we think about the competitiveness of what we're sitting here today with. So, Liz, I want to go, come to you next because, uh, Bob, it sounds like you're doing incredible things at your company. There, as we all know, not every company is doing incredible things. We hope that they will be influenced by this summit. But what, you know, and, and when you look at Northern Europe, for example, many of these things, whether it's sick leave or paternity leave, flexibility, these are um, often legislated. Uh, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon in, in many cases here. So I'm wondering what role do you think unions have now on issues like this, on these um, that might be called often softer issues, but in fact are often of great interest to workers. Absolutely. Um, first, just a quick note of thanks to President Obama. I just want to acknowledge that we're all here because of him taking this issue on and making it a priority, uh, along with his administration. Of course, Tom Perez and Cap as well. But, um, you know, when you think about uh, just close your eyes for a minute and think about what's going on just in a mile radius of this hotel. Um, sometimes we forget. Uh, certainly the work that's being done in that mile radius. Think about the workers. Probably a lot of lobbyists, yes, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of CEOs and a lot of diplomats, but also even just looking at these photos. You know, you got here taking the metro or a cab or, you know, you drove a car that was built by someone. You, you know, the restaurant workers, the local 25 people who served you here from Unite Here. And I, I just wanted, I wanted to say that because I think it's often we get in these rooms and forget we need to take a step back and think about the people who really need these policies. And it is uh, the working people I mentioned, but when you talk to them, and ask them why it's important, it's because they need it to make it now. It has to be a part of our, you know, our, the way of thinking about it. It's not just wages and then work family policies. It's all together. And so I would say, uh, you know, as the workplace has changed, this has become more of a priority, as you said, um, certainly for all, you know, unions, but all working people. And I think it's because of the values, right? As the work place has changed, you know, we've got new technology, we've got, you know, uh, new ways of doing business, but our values have not changed. And I think we need to keep that in mind as well when we talk about how we're going to move forward. It's, we always have to keep in mind, what is it? It's us as Americans, equality and fairness and opportunity and a hard day's, uh, pay, a hard day's work for a fair day's pay. And Absolutely, and so I think um, always keeping those values in mind is really what propels people, you know, to keep their eye on the prize and move these policies forward. Sh Sheila, you have a, um, a personal story which led, of course, to the founding of your company. I'm willing to guarantee that 90% of the people in this room who are parents with young children are having part of their brain today also focused on how the care is going at home. Who's looking after my kids? Are they doing the right things? Are they getting them to the right place? You were in exactly that position with two young children yourself and a part of what we call the sandwich generation, also looking as so many people are now after elderly parents, and that led to the creation of your company. What propelled you to set up Care.com? You know, Bob actually touched on it. Um, sometimes the personal passion and Liz trying to remember the faces out there in a one mile radius. For me, between my sophomore and junior year in college, I got pregnant. And my husband's parents were deceased. My parents were in the Philippines where I was born and raised. And so throughout graduate school and our careers, it was very, very difficult for my husband and I. And fast forward when our little guy, our younger boy, Adam, 
uh, was, and I was working at a tech startup, I begged my parents to come to the US to take care of our little guy. And my mother called me at work, and last time I saw my father that morning was he, he's a teddy bear dad, and he was waving it from the window, saying goodbye to me. Uh, and my mother said he fell backwards down the stairs, carrying Adam, and he had had a heart attack. My father, thank you, today is, is, is well, but thank you for the health care, thank you for the things that we have in the United States, but what made me realize, because I was sandwiched, as Dr. Biden defined in the beginning, between child care and senior care at 29 years old, I was struggling and I saw that millions of families go through this. Yes. So then when we started to peel the onion and start this company, my co-founder Donna is in the audience today, $243 billion is spent on child and senior care. $243 billion. And we just did a survey. The largest budgetary item for families today at $18,000 on average, especially for dual income families, is child care. This is a necessity, not a luxury. This is critical. So some may say that that is a huge opportunity, big business. But what are we really talking about? When we think about the macro environment, and President Obama always is emphasizing this, when we think about the macro environment of what drives economic growth, it's jobs. But we cannot work, you can't have jobs unless you've got great work family and you've got care. We've got to solve these things. Kim, uh, well, first, bef uh, before I move on to Kim, I want to say we will be taking your questions. And on the screens around the room, they're going to put the address where you can tweet questions and ask questions and send us your questions. And we'll look at them in a little bit. So please send them our way. But Kim, I wanted to, to turn to you next and say you have managed in a, in a company that's, that's just not a massively sized corporation to offer some incredibly generous and innovative opportunities for the employees there. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how, how do you make that work? Because a lot of smaller businesses often say, we just cannot afford these sorts of policies. Yeah. Um, well, I think it helps to set a bit of context. Our company was started in the basement of our house uh, by my then husband, Jeff Liebisch, and I. And so we, were, we had one child at the time, and we were uh, working to have a second son. Um, and so we, you know, started out as a family business, and our basement was not as big as the stage that we're <laughs> sitting on. That was almost 23 years ago. So we, um, at that time, were privately, uh, closely held family business. And I grew up in a liberal family, and in, in my mind, um, it was really a joyful surprise to figure out that you could use profits to do really interesting things in business and, and show up as a business role model. And so when we had coworkers, which you know took us a little while to, to actually have that happen in the company, um, it for me was as natural as breathing to say, of course we're going to uh, create a company where people um, at New Belgium, our purpose is to operate a profitable brewery, which makes our love and talent manifest. And um, so there are things that you do with policy, but then there are also things that you do with community, where people, I, my coworkers say to me, I have never worked somewhere where I get to be myself. And I just, that just breaks my heart, you know, that people are working in jobs where they kind of have to leave who they are and their families and they're thinking about life like in the glove box in the car or something. And um, so it's been really important to create a community where love is predominant. We are um, in, we started with open book management in the mid 90s. We sold a part of the company to our coworkers in 96 and then another tranche in 2000. And at the beginning of 2013, I'm pleased to say that we sold the balance of our company to our coworkers. So um, my boys and I were the owners, and now um, all 560 of us are owners at New Belgium. So.
to play devil's advocate here a bit, Nick, uh, we've heard of some of the great things that Bob has found when he's introduced flexible work practices. Kim has found them as well. Sheila has found them as well. Liz, of course, is advocating for them. If they make so much sense for companies, why is every company in America not doing this? Yeah. And why is a company like Yahoo, which had got flexible work practices, then under a new CEO saying, well, actually, you know what, we need to re re row back on some of this? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I mean, you've heard a series of uh, ex excellent examples and reasons why we should be doing it. I should also say the research is very obvious. Uh, the research is very much that firms that adopt better work-life balance practices uh, they, they grow faster, they have higher sales, they have higher profits, uh, they have better management practices. We have, uh, we have a fantastic experiment. I was involved in, out in a massive uh, NASDAQ listed company where they uh, got several hundred volunteers to work from home and they randomized them in a kind of scientific experiment into the people that uh, got to work at home for nine months and the people that had to stay in the office. They did a treatment and control trial, much as the test drugs. And uh, the firm's viewers had saved money at home uh, on office space, but these guys, you know, goof off. They're, they're worried about them messing around. And in fact, when they ran the experiment, nine months later, they discovered the guys at home were 13% more productive, which is a huge benefit. So they were, you know, a day, a, day a week. Which company wouldn't want it? I, well, so at this point, they rolled it out. They save a couple of thousand dollars per person per year. So then the question is, why don't they do it? And I think the simple answer is, uh, firms make mistakes. It's very hard to manage large companies. They're incredibly complicated. Um, you know, the firms we have here are basically got it right, but you, you think about organizations with, that are growing rapidly, thousands of employees, or, you know, that, that they're changing, and it's hard to get it right. The, a good anecdote, I think, on this is, in fact, Moneyball. So, um, Moneyball, you probably know, is the uh, book about baseball. I guess it's, you know, the English version of cricket. It's cricket, <laughs> cricket to us, but basically... <laughs> um, and, in, and in Moneyball, uh, Billy Bean, who's played by Brad Pitt in the film, decides to use data and metrics to evaluate how to pick players and how to make the team play better. And the Oakland A's go on to do very well, they outperform, they make a lot more money. And it takes the rest of the industry about 10 years to catch up. And you know, it's a fantastic story, but as an economist, you think, why weren't other firms doing it? Or why weren't other you know, teams doing it sooner? So I think the answer is it's a new technology. We've heard it's changing very rapidly. There's a lot of firms that are behind the curve. I think, you know, as Liz said earlier, the summit and Obama's intervention is fantastic for pushing this forward to make it clear how this is the right way to go. Um, it's also clear the, the US is behind the curve internationally. So I'm from the UK. I mean, you, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm British. <laughs> and, um, you know, in Britain, we have, you know, Britain, unfortunately, is behind the US on most things except, you know, well, most. Cricket, maybe. <laughs> um, Even we, soccer. Yeah. <laughs> Football. Yeah. Football. Oh. Oh. I'm afraid you're doing better than us. Oh, oh that's it. Low, <laughs> uh, low. Yeah, they told us. They but said, it, like, I, all politics was fine, but yeah. no soccer talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought we were supposed to talk soccer. It's been a bad now, week. Now, now <laughs> I've come. <laughs> Come down, as you say, in Britain, you know, we, I have three kids. My wife had the first two in the UK, in, in England. And uh, you, she get a year of maternity leave. It was amazing. So it goes off, takes, you know, takes time off work. The first six months was paid. Come to the US, have the third, and she's unfortunately never gone back to work after the third kid because, you know, it's so hard. So, you know, it, it's clear what needs to be done. And for some reason, America's far behind the curve. Well, and Bob, talk to us a little bit about, uh, about the millennials, because really, this is, this is inevitable in terms of what that that, the, what that generation wants, the way it views the workforce, at least when, you, when we read the data, it doesn't seem that companies will have any choice. Yeah, so I think this ties the two questions together really nicely. Mm -hmm. So there are organizations today that get this. They see the trends, they see what's coming, and they're making those changes. There's other organizations that either aren't seeing the trends and believe there's an abundant supply of talent out there. And you know, business as usual, and some of the stuff that was in the video is appropriate. So you really have to look forward and say, what is the trends that you know, this country in particular is going to be dealing with? You've got sort of three or four big ones when you look at the population of minorities that can't is going to be the majority going forward. When you look at the combination of the next generation of millennials, that will end up being the majority of our workforce going forward. And in our place, our, our average age is 29. So how do we actually deal with those next generation of millennials? Because that's the future of today and the reality of, I'm sorry, the future of tomorrow, but the reality of today. So we did a study recently. It was what we were told was the largest study around next generation millennials. What came out of that? So a couple of things. One, flexibility 
hugely important. Interesting data point, compared to the baby boomers, not much difference. 70% of the millennials value that concept of flexibility, 60 some odd percent of the baby boomers and the rest of them do as well. The difference is they're willing to move or walk with their feet to say, if you're not giving it to me, I'm out of here. Whereas your baby boomers are more likely to stay. So younger people seem to value it more. A little bit more in terms of how important it is, but in terms of their decisions are willing to walk with their feet. Right. The second thing that they're very interested in, give me choice. One size fits all on these policies does not make sense. Going back to the video, there was a comment made about you want a combination of different things from the concepts of flexibility, which is certainty. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is today's world doesn't deal with certainties. It's both the certain and the uncertain that we have to deal with. And what's really interesting, and just to give you another data point, a couple of years ago, we decided to give our people a reward. And rather than give them the cash, we said, we'll give them a choice. Mm -hmm. Here's your choice, you can take the cash, you can get a technology package, playing to those next generation millennials. You can take um, the time off. You could actually do a charitable contribution, et cetera. So we gave them a lot of choice. Now, let's be honest. 95% of the people took the cash. <laughs> but what was interesting, there was more benefit to give them choice because they want to control their own destiny. And coming back to policies, and I don't care if it's small companies or big companies, you've got to be more attuned to your next generations and the many megatrends this country has to deal with and serving them, not today's reality. Liz, when Claire and I wrote uh, Womanomics five years ago, and we were looking specifically at this issue of workplace flexibility and family life, um, one of the questions we kept getting asked was, well, this might be fine for professionals and white collar workers. How do you actually implement flexibility practices if you have to fill shifts, for example? If you're looking at a production line and there has to be somebody on that line, is it harder to do when we're looking at blue collar workers? Or are there practices that can work for both? Well, I, I guess I would say yes, probably. Um, I don't know in terms of broad brushing, you know, if we could do that. I think you need to look at obviously industry by industry. Um, one industry that pops to mind is the retail sector. And certainly scheduling has been one of the biggest issues for workers uh, in retail. Uh, knowing that scheduling is very uncertain. There is often not enough hours that are given to workers to make full-time employment. Uh, the notice that's provided to workers where, you know, you won't even know if you're working a full week until a couple days beforehand or in some cases hours beforehand. And that makes makes it incredibly challenging for especially working mothers and fathers who need to find childcare. Uh, so sometimes scheduling might not necessarily be as much of an issue for some of these work family uh, types of concepts than other issues such as paid leave, paid sick leave, paid family leave. Um, in the restaurant industry, we know, uh, for example, that workers in restaurants often don't have paid sick days, right? So you think about what what are we doing? We have people working in restaurants coming to work sick because they can't afford not to work, right? I mean, this is insane, right? So um, as we heard earlier, who wants a, a side of uh, flu with your sweet potato fries, yes. right? I mean, so I think the policies are definitely something, as I said earlier, that workers are demanding, workers want. Raising wages certainly is the most important issue to working families, generally speaking. Um, but I think the idea uh, also was mentioned earlier about how do workers demand these kind of policies, right? Uh, it's kind of risky sometimes asking for right. these things. And right. if you don't have the protection of a collective bargaining agreement or a union, um, I'll say it. And I mean, you two have written books on this, right? I mean, the notion of asking for what you need, often you are, there's a lot of risk there. Um, so I think uh, just putting out a plug for the idea that coming together collectively, right, and exercising your voice to give you more strength and protection uh, is what unions are all about. Well, interestingly, I think really, Sheila, what you have done is something like that because it's the, the collective power of b bringing the, these options together for people that is, it's, it's really staggering what you've done. We were talking earlier about not just the, if you could talk a little bit about not just the quality now that you're able to offer to people, but the chance for people who might not have been able to afford childcare easily to now take advantage of some of this through your, your company. Yeah, let me touch on quality, and then I do want to get into choice that Bob also emphasized in the workplace that we're really looking at as well in, in choice for caregiving. But on the quality side, 
what are we talking about? And there are a lot of employers in the audience. We are talking about care for our loved ones. And it's no wonder that this is a key driver for absenteeism and productivity. We're talking about who's raising our kids, who's at home. I want to do a call out to Matthew at Zero to Three, Lynette at Child Care Aware. There are some terrific nonprofits who get it, who share the data, want to build awareness in early childhood quality. So when we started this, Don and I started this, we talked about it. Is it physical care that we're looking for? No, we want high quality care at home. That's what's giving us this peace of mind. So here are two areas that we work on with regards to quality. We're partnering on the policy side with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. We built a care coalition. Big shout out for Ijen and her team. We have built a care coalition where care.com actually brought, Claire, we brought nanny agencies and we brought the unions together to have a dialogue about supporting the domestic bill of rights for California and Massachusetts and doing whatever we can to help professionalize caregiving. Here's a second way. How do we legalize pay so that this is not a job? I mean, this is not just a job that's part-time, but truly professional. So we invested in one of the largest household payroll companies. And as we dug into that business, I was shocked. Four and a half million families should be paying taxes legally to employ a household employee. Do you know how many actually do? 300,000. Wow. Wow. If we're not treating caregivers in a professional manner, and they're caring for our loved ones, then we are gonna enter into a crisis in this country because then who's gonna care for our families? We have to professionalize caregiving. We have to come together, both employers as well as caregivers, as, and, and really have a conversation around quality. Now, when it comes to choice, there are more immigrants, there are millennials, they want choice. So, ethnic background, languages that are spoken at home, how do we want our kids raised in the way that's idiosyncratic to the way our needs are? I'm Filipina American. I get it. I understand. And that kind of choice is important. And then the last piece of data is care.com we measured. A lot of people think that we might be a nanny website, uh, but we are serving all forms, child care, senior care, special needs, all under one umbrella. But 30% of the jobs that are posted on care.com are actually full-time jobs. What's surprising is 60% are part-time, often after school, dual income families, hair on fire moments like that breakfast picture, trying to figure out who's gonna care for my kids, 1.7 average on the family, who's doing the soccer pickup, who's doing the daycare dash, it's mayhem and it's crazy. And who's supporting and how are we providing that kind of choice for families? That is what's critical and it's important and that's what's gonna increase productivity in the workplace and the economics show it. Kim, we've been hearing that the, um, clearly the business case for flexibility and the need for better care at home and flexibility across the board. If you could point to two things that you've done in your company that have really worked, that other companies in this room could replicate, what would they be? Um, we have what we call, and this is, I think, pretty common in a lot of companies, although I'm often surprised things that I think are pretty common are perhaps <laughs> not. Um, we have what we call PTO, personal time off. It is not earmarked for a particular thing. You can use it for childcare. You can use it if you're sick. You can use it to go on vacation, whatever you want. And um, I think, you know, sort of, setting that tone that this is your, and it's ours is pretty generous. Um, in the first year of employment, you have nearly three weeks off of paid time off, which is, I think, kind of unusual to have that much. Um, and I think kind of back to something around love or relationship, we are a manufacturer. We employ blue collar people to um, wear rubber boots and, and you know, put swing links together to make beer. And um, in that, you know, shift work is harder in that way. But because of this climate that we've set up where we say, of course you need time, you know, because your kid has a play that you want to go to or your mother needs to go to the doctor and you need to take her, there's just this sense even in, um, even for our folks who do hourly shift work that um, we are there to accommodate one another. 
and that there, no one would say, what do you mean you're going to, you know, go do that thing, whatever it is. So I don't, those are maybe not, um, let me think about some other examples that we have. I think just generally speaking, in terms of building that robust community of people, we practice open book management. All of our coworkers know where all of the money goes. We practice high involvement culture. We expect them to build the strategy with us every year. And um, we have you know, broad equity sharing through 100% ownership. And the three legs of those stool, of, of that stool, is a really powerful tool for us in um, people thinking about, you know, how this community of coworkers affects their families, and how, and you know, people's families are intimately involved in our lives. We play together quite a bit. So um, I don't know if those are. You know, helpful or not, but um, those are a few of the smaller things that we do. And Nick, I wonder um, one thing that came up earlier, but I'd love to to address it again. We a couple of years ago, everybody was taken aback when Yahoo <laughs> announced that well, no more flexibility. The company that had been known for this incredibly generous flexibility policy was retrenching, and Best Buy we we saw do something similar. And, and, and I remember Caddy and I at the time thought, well, are, is the trend, are things suddenly moving in the other direction? Was this post-recession? Right. What's, why, why, do you think, why do you think that happened? And do you think that there are times when companies need to put aside some of these policies, or are they always going to be useful in any economy and in any situation? Well, you know, th thankfully, the, uh, the data overall looks pretty good. So, you know, on the one, well, on the one hand, the U.S. is improving. So if you look at, for example, working from home, it's gone up by 50% over the last 10 years. Uh, you look at you know, childcare flexibility, they've improved. On the other hand, though, if you look at it by global tables, uh, the US is still pretty far behind. So it's gone from being you know, worst in the class to uh, impro <laughs> improving, but still pretty bad. Um, why is that? Well, you know, Yahoo's a great case, because I don't know how much people know. Around, uh, I, know, you know I live out in, in uh, California, in, in Silicon Valley, in Stanford. And it was a huge uh, media storm. So Marissa Mayer, who is the CEO of Yahoo, uh, a, a email leaked out saying that they were banning working from home. And uh, it's turned into a big media storm. She was heavily criticized. And what seems to have happened, if you follow the case through, is they actually relaxed back. And so what happened initially, they had people that were working from home five days a week. They weren't in the office ever. It was hard for them to liaise in the team, and you didn't work well. They went, went to the opposite situation, where nobody was allowed to work at home at all. And that created big problems, too. Firstly, it's very hard to retain and attract the kind of people that need to be around their families. But secondly, it was bad for their performance. You, uh, you know, I remember when you looked in T-Trip, people at home can concentrate better. They have time away. They can step back. They can think. They really value it. They're prepared to be flexible. So for both of those reasons, Yahoo have stepped back and they've gone back to something that's now pretty common, which is um, you know, many employees are allowed to work at home Monday or Friday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're all in the office together. The team has to be there. You're engaged. Monday and Friday, you want to be at your kids' play or do something with the children and then work in the evening or maybe on the weekend or have four days a week. That's become a much more common model. I mean, the other example I saw that worked very well was uh, JetBlue. So JetBlue is a big uh, airline, uh, and JetBlue operates out of uh, Salt Lake City. And there they, they aim for high quality, and to do this, they allow people to work from home and to flex their time as well. And what they got is a, a large number of very educated, very impressive working mothers that would work from home. And I remember visiting one of these women, and she said, um, I start work at 5 AM. I work for an hour and a half until 6.30, then my kids wake up. I you know, cook them breakfast, I take them to school, I come back at 8, I work till 10, I then do exercise class till 11, I then go back on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And for people like this, this works incredibly well. So if you want to get women working and men that, you know, have to, Vice President Biden was talking about earlier for working fathers, if you want to get them involved into the labor force, flexibility is key. And they drag people in and help promote growth. So it's very much a win-win situation. It's a win for firms. Uh, sales goes up, profit goes up, growth goes up, and it's a win for employees. They're happier, they're, they are more productive, and it's something that you know, I'm pleased that's being pushed forwards. Okay, Bob, I want to, there's some questions that have come into us, and this is something, again, that you know, Claire and I have come across, is companies that have flexible policies in their policy, 
but when it actually comes to practice, there's a stigma against them mm -hmm. having it. How do you address companies with good policies but an informal bias against employees actually taking advantage of those policies? So to me, the, there's a couple of things in that question. It's about tone at the top, and I'm going to call it tone at the middle. So there's too many times, and I'm going to give you a real life example, when we went and took our three-year people and wanted to make sure that we were rewarding a milestone. And you can argue it was almost like the so soccer trophy mentality. You showed up on a soccer field, and you got a trophy. Many people in our organization would have said, can we stop rewarding for that? Well, you can do that if you want, but maybe you want to flip this upside down on its head. So let's sort of build a policy from the bottoms up. So we actually did an exercise where we said, well, if someone's going to stay with us for three years, let's reward them. And what the reward's going to be is not financial, but it's going to be personal. And we're going to send you away for a week, and we're going to teach you life skills. Health care, financial well-being, elderly care, all of the above. How do you manage stress, et cetera? And great policy at which you want to put in place. Here's the problem, folks. When they went away for a week and they came back, if that 58-year-old white guy was saying, get your butt back in the chair, you got a problem. So now the question is, how does tone in the middle really become accountable for making sure this stuff comes to life? So now I go back to, if I were to answer the question, what's really important for us? It's about talking about this stuff publicly. It's setting the right tone all the way through the organization and actually using real life examples time and time again in terms of what's working, what's not working being very respectful in the process. You don't want to be threatening in any way, but it's really important to do that. And equally as important, going back to the question you asked Nick, is talking more about why. When, when Marissa made the change, it was headline news, but no one got into the issue of why did she make that change. I'll give you another example. When we changed from a flexible Friday, everybody, every Friday you could take off, and we wanted to move it to every day is flexible, so do what you want. Inside the organization, everybody started saying, oh, flexibility is not important anymore. Like it became a policy we just took away. No, 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 that's not what we're saying, guys. <laughs> what we're saying is flexibility should be 24-7, 365. And if I've got people in the middle or the chain of command that's not evidencing that, then I've got to take action on them. Right. Accountability, risk and reward, and making sure we're talking about it time and time again. Um, I, Sheila, this is a question that I think will be interesting for you, and you touched on it earlier, but talking about care workers specifically, but also the need for elder care, mm. as you were mentioning, um, what can be done to ensure that families can get affordable care for their parents and their children? And I understand that the, you know, what, what you have created to some extent offers people more options, but is there more that can be done than just your, what your company's doing right now to try to make care affordable and at the same time make sure that the care workers are, as you mentioned, adequately paid and taken care of? Um, so it's really this marketplace that we're building. We've got 10 million members here in the United States alone, and we are in 16 countries now. But if we think about the U.S., um, we're, we're very proud that we're working now also in making sure that on our website, all caregivers, uh, and it's very clear to families, is being paid above or at minimum wage. And making that clear, because oftentimes there's not also a huge awareness for families to understand the importance of that, and it is about education and awareness building. Another statistic that also we have found in building the company is that 15% of, of um, our uh, members are 50K income households and below. So people think that people that are only going online are high income people. In fact, on average, we're 75K income, and it certainly skews higher, but the fact that we've got 15% of 50K income and below and growing means this really is a need for family, families, and we're making it affordable because it's so fragmented and it's very difficult and previously very inefficient in a very fragmented space. And we can proudly say that we're now working with senior care agencies, home care agencies, nanny agencies, so that we're helping grow their businesses too because they're getting access to both families as well as caregivers, because now we have the largest vetted caregiver database in the country so that it's, we're also making it efficient to recruit caregivers on care.com so that we can help businesses grow. So in this fragmented space, it's about making it affordable, making choice available to all families, and making sure that it's ubiquitous enough in all zip codes across the country so that they can have access to care. But go ahead. Well, I was just gonna follow up, I don't know, maybe for, for Liz or Nick, I mean, Ultimately, are, are we talking about 
needing more of a tax incentive mm. for, for caregivers? Are we talking about corporations pitching in a little bit? Because what, really, what is the answer to making this mm. more affordable for people? I don't really see how that happens. And I was thinking of, I see Leader Pelosi in the front. Um, it's demanding also our policymakers. Uh, Pressuring, pressuring our policymakers to uh, pass an agenda that's already ready for passage, right? Which is when uh, women succeed, America succeeds. Thank you very much. Um, but also, I'll put a, a little uh, PSA in there for collective bargaining again, because we've seen solutions actually real time, uh, for example, up in New York with SEIU 1199, you know, coming together with workers and employers, uh, putting a little bit of uh, contribution from each into a trust fund uh, to provide for uh, care for whether it's, you know, elderly or children or whatever to subsidize that. So there are creative ways of doing that out there if we all work together. I think that's the big point, the big takeaway is that we're all gonna need to work together. We touched a little bit there on stigma and talking of, of working together. I'm interested to know whether you think that there is still clearly a split between mothers and fathers when it comes to this issue of pushing for flexibility and childcare. I, mean, I was very interested speaking to you, Sheila, earlier. You said that 15% or something of the, peop of the families, parents who come to your website are dads. That's still fairly low as a number of fathers who are equally involved in this process. I mean, is that something, Kim, that you see? Is this still essentially a mother's issue? Because I think it's, once we move beyond that, we will then be able to reduce the stigma about around flexible processes. I would say that it's certainly more of a mother issue than a, than a mother and father issue. Although, you know, everyone's case is different, but I think that does inherently, sadly, sort of diminish the power of it if it's, if it's mostly mothers who are um, trying to find a way to galvanize leadership around this important issue. Um, uh, you know, in our organization, we provide maternity leave, paternity leave, um, same sex, something. I uh, know. <laughs> There's a, a loud conversation right. going on back there. Uh, domestic partner benefits, uh, adoption assistance. So. Do you, I mean, Nick, I mean, I have this kind of fantasy that because my children, I have four of them, lost them, have seen. <laughs> their mother working, but just as importantly, they've seen their father make lunch boxes, organize play yeah. dates, get the kids to school. I travel a lot for work. My husband, Tom, has to take over completely in those circumstances. So will the next generation, the generation that we're, when you look at the data, are they changing? Um, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, one thing I should say, I think the importance of role models is uh, really important. I, I mentioned earlier, after coming uh, to the US, because after our third child, my wife, you know, isn't working right now. And we had one of these horrifying situations where um, my five-year-old daughter, we asked her, what does she want to do when she grew up? And she'd uh, watch Frozen, and so naturally she says, be a princess <laughs> with special powers. <laughs> and uh, Not a bad day, uh, and uh, we it. said, you know, That's that doesn't way. work out. What else? She said, marry a rich man. <laughs> and at that point, you know, oh. uh, I became kind of, you know, this whole, my, my mom, I'm one of four kids, my mom worked, I always thought it was important. And part of the, the way to make this happen is, is through policy. If you look in France, for example, France has a very uh, statutory intervention to try and subsidize, encourage firms to pay for childcare. That helps French women go to work. We were talking in the break, fascinating about Japan. So Japan's had terrible growth for the last 15 years. It's been a, a basket case country. And what they're trying to do now to turn it around is actually to focus on women, get them back into work. So Japan has very low levels of female labor force participation. And also actually has very low birth rates because women really don't want to be stuck in this terrible setup whereby they're expecting them to both work, look after their kids, have no help from you know, their partners. And so they're trying to be very pro helping uh, childcare, helping firms subsidize it, being basically pro, pro women. And it's their, it's their route to growth. I mean, they're seeing it as their n number one policy to drive economic growth. So I think it goes, you know, there's clearly a worker thing that's important, there's a firm thing that's important, but the bigger picture of growth that's going to pay for schools and hospitals is where we need to uh, drive this to. And I know we have one question specifically for Bob, and you wanted to comment on the last one anyway, but which was, how would you talk to other large companies that are on the fence about adopting some of these policies? 
So I have a, a privilege, which is to go to see a lot of organizations, big and small, doesn't matter where, across the country and around the world. And we do get into these kind of conversations. Um, the thing I would be respectfully challenging of these organizations is where is the CEO's head on this topic, and where is the board's responsibility on this topic? It is you. So I'll try to tie these two things together, because let's be honest, right now, we do have a stigma issue still with this. Look, the majority of the audience here is women. No disrespect, but nonetheless, this, this has got to be a balanced issue. But what's really interesting is you can walk into a CEO's office, and if it's on their agenda, if they talk about it passionately, it will get done. Right. It will get done. And the reality is when you walk in and someone isn't getting it, you've got to do two or three things. You've really got to respectfully challenge the business case or get really personal with them. One of two things. It's the only way you're going to make it happen. And if not them, then where's the attack going to be? I'll give you one small example. I went to one organization and a bunch of people I met with the management team, and they said, well, the CEO doesn't get this. They're not talking about it passionately. And my next question was, well, then who is? Who's the next gen? Or where's the board? You want a sandwich, let's talk about the sandwich. It's got to be eaten from the top or build it up from the bottoms. But nonetheless, this is important, of which the voices of the employees today and the voices of the employees tomorrow have got to come to life because it is the responsibility of the management team to make this stuff happen each right. and every day. CEOs, you heard that. There you go. <laughs> Everybody show this to your CEOs. We want to thank our panel very much, Kim and Nick and Sheila, Bob. Liz, Caddy, Caddy, <laughs> and, and myself, thank you so much for thank listening you. to this. It is such thank an you. important thank issue. You. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Please welcome President and Founder of Family Values at Work, Ellen Bravo. Thank you so much, President Obama, the White House staff, the Department of Labor, CAP, for this amazing summit. And thanks also to, I think they're there, I can see nothing, the women in Congress who've been leading the way with their When Women Succeed, American Succeed program, taking it on the road. I want to call attention to some other amazing people in the audience who were nominated and got tickets to come here today because their expertise matters. The experts include people like Arlisa Hurd from Detroit. When her son had bouts of sickle cell anemia and had to be in the hospital, Arlisa said, I will not leave you there alone. And every time she was docked her pay for doing it. Rhiannon Brochard from Chicago, her special needs kid when the schools closed because it was too cold, she said to him, I will not leave you alone. And she lost her job. Shelby Ramirez, who had lunch with the president, two and a half weeks, that's all it was, of unpaid leave to care for her daughter and her dad when their surgeries overlapped. And she almost faced eviction and had to pawn and lose the only thing of monetary value that she owned. Melissa Bravo, for whom having a baby meant losing her job and going into a cycle of debt. And Larry Kenny, who took personal tragedy and turned it into commitment to be a best practice employer. And he understands that best practices include not just providing good policies for your workers, but speaking out to make sure that there's a floor for every worker in the country. These folks, and there's dozens of them in this room, have transformed their own pain and hardship into power by speaking up together and sharing their experiences to show the need and the tremendous benefit of common sense and wildly popular policies like paid sick days and family and medical leave insurance. And they're helping lead the broad and diverse coalitions in our Family Values at Work network that have won, pay attention to this number, nearly 20 million Americans now have paid, newly have paid sick days and family and medical leave insurance because of these folks and our partners all over the country. And here's what they say. These experts say, we cannot allow that the very thing that makes you a good parent, 
or a good child to your parents costs you your paycheck or your job. We cannot allow a parent's presence during the day in their toddler's hospital room to be their work number on a whiteboard because their family would take a financial hit otherwise. We cannot allow our values as Americans to be compromised. Vice President Biden is right, the biggest family value is time for family. And we absolutely know what works. We have the evidence. And our families, our businesses, and our economy depend on us guaranteeing it to every single person in this country. So will you please join us in this fight? Like us on Facebook, sign up on our familyvaluesatwork.org website, read the stories of the people I'm talking about, get involved in these local campaigns, we'll all work together for these national campaigns, and will you please right now stand up if you are involved in a local fight anywhere for paid sick days or family leave or anything that helps working families, living wage, immigrant rights, collective bargaining, ending pregnancy discrimination, domestic worker rights, child care, fair scheduling. Guess what? Guess what? We are going to become the nation we claim to be, and it's because of all of you. I'm so proud to be part of this movement with you. Thank you, thank you so much. You like the bumpy slide? I like the bumpy slide. I go first. I go first. We'll see who goes first. I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> me first. Okay, you both go first. My name's Jay Bukowski. I'm the dad of Jack and Ava, uh, the twin two-and-a-half-year-old terrors that uh, <laughs> have sort of uh, invaded my life Ava, for the better. Awesome. He's a truck on yours, yeah. <laughs> Jack and Ava were born at 28 weeks, which uh, is significantly premature. They spent 69 days in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, they, they were our little babies in a bubble. Well, we left the hospital after a week of recovery for my wife. And, uh, you know, I had to leave them there. It's one of the hardest things to do, to have to leave your child behind as you're going home. The doctor said for the first six months, no daycare. It was too much of a health risk. So Christie's paid family leave ran out. Well, I burned through all my vacation days and all my sick days first. And then I took paid family leave so that one of us could be here with them at all times. If we didn't have access to paid family leave, it would have been incredibly hard to do, um, especially with twins. I think it's kind of an outdated um, way of thinking that the mom does the child rearing and the dad goes to work and brings home the paycheck. You know, the dad has to have a part in the family. I think having taken an active role in my kids' first few months has brought me a lot closer to them. I never thought I'd get to this point, but I have inside jokes with my two and a half year olds. You're not gonna get eight hours sleep anymore, but you're gonna get to cuddle with your kids. So it's so much better than eight hours sleep. <laughs> Jason isn't the only one who can afford to spend time with a newborn or seriously ill loved one because of family values at work and their partners. Today, nearly 17 million have access to family medical leave insurance. This means Babies can breastfeed longer. More seniors can live independently. Kids heal faster with a parent at their side. Businesses have reliable workers and customers that can support them. We all win with paid family leave. Please welcome mother, activist, journalist, and founder of the Shriver Report, Maria Shriver, and senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, Maya Harris.
Good afternoon. We're gonna make this quick because no one's been to the bathroom in about two hours. I know, I saw everybody was out there trying to get there and they shut it all down. So um, let's just jump right in here. We talked, um, you, it was announced about you, Maria, um, and the Shriver Report, which uh, earlier this year, you, along with the Center for American Progress, mm -hmm put out the report. And at the time that you put out the report, you talked about it as being a national reality check. What did you mean by that? What, was, what motivated you to do the report? Well, we had done two previous reports. The first one, obviously, with the Center for American Progress detailing that women were becoming primary breadwinners in a majority of American families. The second one really looked at the population of women who were unpaid caregivers while also being breadwinners, and we looked at the epidemic of Alzheimer's. And we started to think, well, if women are primary breadwinners and they're also caregivers and caretakers, what's happening to them? And the fact is one in three working women in this country are living on the brink of poverty. That's what the Shriver Report came out with the Center for American Progress and televised and communicated to the country that the image of you know, women on the brink was not what it was 50 years ago, that the American family had changed, that the women who were at the forefront of their families looked a lot like everybody in this room. And what about the research in terms of what you found um, when you were out? I know you did, um, over the course of two years, interviews, research, um, pulled together a diverse set of, of voices. You did a poll um, of, of Americans. And how, did right. people, how were people responding to these issues, talking about these issues in the poll? Well, we also did a film on HBO called Paycheck to Paycheck, which you can still watch on HBO Go. And what, what we found was that everywhere I went, all across the country, people came up to me and said, that's my story. I also live paycheck to paycheck. I feel unheard, I feel invisible. And the polls showed that what people really wanted, which has been discussed here today, was time. Time to take care of a parent, time to take care of themselves, time to take care of a child. And they felt really judged, and really, and I think the thing that kind of struck me the most was how invisible families feel across this country that I meet when I'm going out as a reporter for NBC. They just say, I don't know what's going on in Washington, I don't know why we don't have these policies. What can we do? How do we raise our voices? And what has some of the other uh, sort of public reaction been to it beyond the families who are most directly impacted? Well, I think what's been really exciting, and I think what everybody's heard here today, is that there are things going on. Uh, there has been such leadership by so many of the people in this room for many, many years. And I think just in the last six months, I was at the mayor's conference yesterday in Dallas, and they convened a task force on income inequality. Uh, this is a defining issue of our time. People, and, and I think it's great that the mayors are saying, we're gonna tackle this at the grassroots level. We're, gonna, the, we're on the front lines of humanity and we're gonna make an impact because we know that this affects women and men. And I think that the idea that women who are out there working, who are living on the brink, they're saying, look at, I'm trying to raise my family. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking for a hand up. I was encouraged to hear that President Obama said, you know, Thank you. <laughs> um, his mother used food stamps for a while to get herself up off of the brink. And so many of the women that I have met along the way said, you know, don't judge me. Don't judge me where I'm at. You know, what? wait and see where I'm going. And where I'm going is up. And what has surprised you? I mean, you've been traveling around the country for the last six months talking to an array of audiences. You've talked to electeds, what you've talked to people who are on the, living on the brink. What has surprised you, either in terms of the stories that you've heard, the facts you've learned? Well, what surprises me always that people who have nothing are so inspired to do better. Um, the people who are on the brink are determined, they're hopeful. Uh, they're proud to be Americans. They want to give their children a better job, and they aren't who the image is. I think the image is old, it's outdated, and I think that's one of the things when I sit here today uh, that we need to, as a nation, catch up to who the American family is, to who people are that are struggling and living on the brink. That, that the image that they're sitting around doing nothing is, couldn't be further from the truth. And um, so, so I think that it's really the communication. I think also what really surprised me is how many families are unaware of 
programs that, are, that exist that can help them off the brink. And that's something I learned while I was First Lady of California, that government often passes laws and then forgets to tell the people that they're passed. <laughs> and this, it sounds funny, but it was something that when I got to Sacramento, it was kind of like you wouldn't put out a movie or a book and not tell anybody about it. But government does that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one thing when I was First Lady, we put all these programs together that help low-income uh, people, and we called it We Connect, and we connected them together to make them easy to sign up for, accessible, and available to people. So to let them know you're available for the earned income tax credit. You can get a child tax credit. You can get energy assistance. These programs exist to help you. And people over and over again were like, I didn't know that. I don't know anything about that. And so it also struck me when I travel around the country how segregated, really, the women who are, quote, empowered and doing well are from the women who are on the ground working two and three jobs to keep mm -hmm. their families afloat. Mm -hmm. Well, what about, you know, you talk about catching up and backing out the report some to the broader environment and, and you know, in which all of this is unfolding. Mm -hmm. Um, this is clearly such a widespread issue. We've talked today about how many families are living on the brink, living paycheck to paycheck. And at the same time, it's not entirely clear that our public conversation, our political discourse, yeah. is occurring in a way that is going to move us in the direction we need to go in order to get the changes that we know we need. So you're, you're, you're a journalist, you've been a producer, you know, so much of that conversation unfolds in the media, media shapes public opinion. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Are we having the right conversation today in the public domain that's going to move us in the right direction? Well, I think it depends what you're watching. <laughs> And I think uh, we, we are living more and more uh, in a segregated media culture. People watch what they want to watch, and they don't hear about what else is going on. And the Schreiber Report came into life, really, as a nonprofit media initiative because the conversation that it was having wasn't being had on television. And, uh, you know, I work in television, and oftentimes, you know, you can go and do a great story, and they're like, give me a minute and a half. And I'm like, how am I going to tell that story in a minute and a half? So I think that uh, we have to do a better job communicating who the American family is in 2014. I think we need to do a better job at communicating what programs exist. I think we have to communicate to Democrats, Republicans, men and women that they have a voice and that the change starts with them. I think that's really important for everybody in this room. Uh, when I was first lady in California, people would come up to me all the time and say, you should do this and you should do that. And I'd be like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, you know, I have kids. And I'm like, me too. And they're like, I have a sick parent. I'm like, me too. And they're like, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. And I'm like, yes, you can. You can begin if you're a parent in raising kids who are conscious and compassionate and value the care economy. I think that's. I think that's really, really important. I think if you are a parent of a boy, you can raise him to believe and to respect women. Yeah. I think that's really important. Um, I think if you're the parent of a daughter, you can raise her with self-esteem, but also to raise her to understand that men are not her enemy, that men are her allies, and that together they're going to accomplish these things. I think that's really important. Um, I also think it's really important for women who are out in the workforce to understand that there's a whole economy and substructure that allows them to do that, and that to pay those people, whether they're in your house, taking care of your parent, or moving out from there, a living wage. And I think um, I, I often find people say, well, you know, I pay my trainer $200, but the person taking care of my kids, I'm paying her $9 under the table. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a lot of, um, you know, change that can start in our own homes, start with the kind of employer we want to be, start giving to people who work for us the same things that we ask for from our employers. Uh, people need to know that they can vote for men or women who talk about the care economy, who talk about the sharing economy, who talk about conscious, compassionate, caring workplaces, the culture. I think there's a lot that each of us can do, speak up for and ask of our political leaders, our business leaders, but also of ourselves.
And I know you're going to go out and continue to do this work um, and carry this work forward. What do you want everyone else who's here to go out and do after they leave this? Because as we've said today, this is one step along a, a long path to change. What is well, your hope for, for well, what happens a, when we leave here today? I think a lot of cities out there. And there's a lot of states out there. And I think I like to believe that every single person is a reporter of their own story. Um, I'm a big believer in that. And that there is an audience uh, for your story. You can inspire other people with your story. If you write uh, today what you heard, what you saw, what struck you, uh, get 10 people in your community, uh, get people in your workplace. Uh, to talk about what kind of culture you want in your workplace. I was very encouraged. I don't drink beer, but I'm going to drink beer from that woman's company that, that she had today. <laughs> because I think, you know, women make 80% of the consumer decisions in this country. You can put your money to companies that espouse your values. That's really important. Um, I think, as I said, you can spend money uh, with companies. You can vote for people that espouse your beliefs. Don't give your vote away for free. And to see yourself, I think, really as what I call an architect of change. Tell your story, share your story, speak up, speak out. Don't sell your vote. Don't sell your money. And think of yourself as the best investment in yourself, in the children you raise, and in the companies you support, and the people you send to Washington. And demand uh, nothing short of excellence. We are the <laughs> <laughs> We are the architects of change. Thank architects you, Maria Shriver. And thank you all for being here. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. something a little fun. Um, so if you're nine new facts, you found, you, you found that there was um, fact number uh, eight was the results of a Nielsen-Harris poll that was done just in advance of the summit, uh, which found, among a lot of other things, that you know over a third of parents think they've been passed over for promotion, a raise, or a new job due to the need for a flexible work schedule. What's important about these statistics and all the statistics that Betsy went through is we need to be telling everyone in America what working families really look like and what the struggles are that they go through. And that's what this summit is all about. So you're going to help me do that now. We're going to do something fun. So now I want you to take out your cell phones. Now when in a summit has somebody told you to take out your cell phones? <laughs> We're going to take out your cell phones. And we're going to have instructions come up on the screen that will tell you how we're going to do a live interactive poll as we speak about what everybody in this room has been experiencing um, uh, in your lives as working families. So you see up there, you want to hit the, uh, so I'm the perfect person to do this because I'm really such a technophobe. <laughs> I'm really not good at this. So open up your phone. Go to your text messaging, and you want to text to 22333. So put that up in the two, just like we were sending a message, to 22333. And where our first question is, I feel like my commitment to my family responsibilities has held me back in my career. If that's true, you text the word WORK01. If it's false, you text the word WORK02. You can also do it to, through Twitter. So if you tweet at poll and you use the same keywords, if it's true for you that I feel like my commitment to my family responsibilities has held me back in my career, you, t you will put in that keyword work 01 or false work 02. So if it's true for you that a commitment to your family responsibilities has held you back in your career, do that. And we're doing, we're sort of getting those questions live, and you see that a majority of people in this room, that's been your experience, that a commitment to your family responsibilities has held you back in your career, which is just the experience that Americans across the country are having. So let's try question number two. Question number two. I've experienced an employer overtly 
or covertly, so this is what the president was talking about, right? Overtly or covertly questioning my commitment to my job because of my family responsibilities. This is like you're going to the parent-teacher conference and instead of saying, oh, you know, it's like really not so, not so committed to the job. If that's been your experience, that you've been overtly or covertly questioned, your commitment because of your family responsibilities. You check true, if that's true for you, work 03. If it's false, you text work 04. You go on, we're, we're sort of tabulating those. So over, nearly 60%, nearly 60% of us in our work experiences have experienced exactly what that, the president was talking about, is that conflict between work and family coming to clash and where it, your employer's looking at you and saying that you don't have the commitment. That's the kind of attitude we need to change. That's the kind of attitude, like Mark was up here talking about at EY, Bob was talking about it. We've got CEOs that we need to change from the top down to change that attitude. One more question. My job caused me to miss a family moment or event that I still regret missing. All right, this one hits really close to home. <laughs> I could start rattling off not just a family moment, there are several. So if it's true for you that your job caused you to miss a family moment or event that you still regret missing, you text true, work 05 if it's true, work 06 if it's false. Okay, look at this one. <laughs> All right, this is pretty telling, guys. 88%, yep, 88% of us have missed those events. And that's not the kind of country we want to have. That's not the kind of workplaces that we want to have. That's not the future we want to build for our kids, uh, for the next generation. So these are all the motivations. This is the stuff we want to change through the summit, which is just the starting point. I just want to emphasize, today is not the end point. Today is just the starting point for the work we have to do. So one more thing before we go to break, and we have an opportunity here to recognize some great leaders who've been leading the charge on this. So what I wanna do now is I wanna bring up to the stage all the wonderful members of Congress who are with us, and I'm gonna just take off, tick off their names. I want, we're gonna bring them up to the stage. I want you to give them a huge round of applause for their leadership. <laughs> Representative Joyce Beatty. <laughs> Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Senator Amy Klobuchar, Representative Rosa DeLauro, Representative Donna Edwards, Representative Robin Kelly, Representative Jan Schakowsky, Representative Susan Bonamici, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson, Representative Michelle Lujan Grisham, Representative Chelly Pingree, Representative Doris Matsui, and of course, our leader, Nancy Pelosi. When women succeed, America succeeds! <laughs> the leader told me. <laughs> All right, thank you. So we are now gonna head out to our, first of all, I also wanna thank all of you because you can tell this has been an overflow day, an overflow room. I know some of you didn't get lunch, some of you didn't get seats, you've been very patient. It just shows you how much enthusiasm, how much passion, how much power is in this room to change working places so they work for working families. So thank you all very much. So finally, as we head into our last segment, we're gonna leave, go to breakouts, which will start in about three, at about 3.15, so you've got some time. Um, and then, after your breakouts, come back into this room. We have a final concluding plenary. We're gonna have folks like Leader Pelosi, 
Gloria Steinem. And we will end the day, we will end the day with Robin Roberts interviewing the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. So be sure to come back. <laughs>